Now, what in the world does the day mean? The day. The day. It's referenced in several passages of scripture, but most clearly in 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 10. And this is one of a number of passages in the New Testament that talks about what we'll come to know as the Bema, seat of Christ. So this passage will be on the screen right behind me. Please follow along as I read it. Therefore, Paul speaking to the Corinthian church, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. Meaning as long as we are here on earth, away from the Lord physically, we have to live by faith because we can't see them. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. I mean, if we're all honest, we would say, yeah, take me to heaven right now. <laughs> that sounds good to me. I'd like to be with Jesus right now. But we can't. He's left us here for a reason. Verse 9. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. Whether we are here on earth or in heaven, it will be our driving motivation. Whether we are at home in the body or with the Lord, we have as our one focus to please Jesus. And it should be today to please him. And the word please is the same word used in Romans 12, 1, where we're told to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to him. It's what we're about. We want to bring a smile to the face of Jesus. Why is that our driving force? Paul gives us a reason in verse 10. We must, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. Now, wait a minute, Paul, wait a minute. Time out. We don't have to go through the judgment. Well, the great white throne judgment in Revelation 20 and verse 5 and following are those people whose names are found in the Lamb's Book of Life. Those who trusted in Jesus for their salvation. And they will be ushered straight into heaven. And those whose names are not found there, they will be cast away for all eternity. And that's the judgment that we get to escape because we're Christians. But the Bible teaches that Christians, as Christians, there's a judgment for us as well. And that's what he's talking about here. The word judgment seat is bema in Greek. Not beamer. We're not talking about a German sports car. <laughs> bema. Bema. A bema was an elevated seat at the top of the steps where the judges used to sit and cast judgment upon people. People would bring disputes before the judge and he would make settlements there. And that's the place where a ruler would be seated when he gave a verdict on the matter. In John 19, 13, we have John's account of Pilate sitting on his bema seat when he passed judgment on Jesus. It's called the judge's seat. And when the judge sits on the seat and gets his ruling, that ruling becomes law. It's his final word. And according to the Bible, we're going to stand before Jesus one day at a great seat of judgment, apparently, in 2 Corinthians 5.10, one day, called the day, we who are Christians will stand before Christ and he will judge us. Now, what will that judgment look like? Well, that's a great question. The Bible doesn't give a whole lot of detail about that, but it does teach us some general principles. Today, we're going to find out about that day and discover how really short life is and how really short it is and how little time we have to make an eternal impact. Now, how am I going to do this? Well, I'm going to tell you a story. And it's a story that Tim Stevenson has written. He's the pastor of Crossroads Bible Church in Louisville. And it will change the way you live. And as I've been reading it, it changes the way I live. So I know it will change the way you live. The book is called The Bema. And it goes something like this. Boy, have I had a day. <laughs> 
What a day. I mean, out of all the days, this was the day. Literally, the day. There's never been a day like this in the history of mankind like this day. And in order for me to tell you about it, I have to take you back to the very beginning of it. It started out like most every day did. I got up before my wife and kids did. I got up at 3 a.m. I had to get to my office early and work on this proposal. And lately I've been skipping breakfast, I've been skipping church, I've been skipping the kids' games, I've been skipping dinner, and I've been skipping everything because I have to get this proposal done. And the reason I have to get this proposal done is because the boss has been tightening the screws a little bit. And um, he told me if this thing flies with the Adams Group, there may be a partnership in it for me. Oh, boy. And, and then I, 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 I want to provide for my family and have the stuff that we want. And I'll, it'll, I'll make up for the things that I've been skipping. And so I'm really driving for this thing. And I had my entire staff coming in before 6 o'clock. And I wanted to be ahead of the game by the time they got here. So I showered, got dressed, and left. So I get to my office and enter the lobby, and there's Joe. I don't even remember his last name. Uh, Joe, the, Joe the security guard. Maybe that's his last name. Joe the security guard. Good morning, Mr. Mathewson. That's me, Daniel James Mathewson. Good morning, Joe. Uh, how are you today, sir? Well, I, I'm fine, Joe. Has the Lord been good to you today? Well, it's 4.30 a.m., Joe, but yes, the Lord's been good to me. <laughs> And he starts quoting me a verse. Well, God bless you, Mr. Madison. And remember, no temptation has seized you except what has come. Oh, my goodness. I pushed the button on the elevator several times to speed things up. The guy's nuts. He's too sunny for my type. How can he be quoting scripture, you know, at this hour? And I finally get to my office. And when I walk in there, there's Juanita, my cleaning lady. And Juanita, I, I thought I asked you to be here before I got here. Oh, I'm so sorry, Mr. Matthewson. I've been trying, but you keep coming in earlier and earlier. I, I can't keep up. <laughs> now, I'm a Christian. I'm not going to throw her out. So I do the next best thing. I, I, I sit down at my desk and I start working and ignoring her, trying to communicate with every fiber of my being that I don't want to talk to her right now. And she wants to talk to me, you know. Hey, Mr. Matthewson. Uh, hello, hello, hello. Juanita's just dusting the furniture, and she walks over, and she picks up a picture on my desk. Oh, Mr. Matthewson, you have such a wonderful family. Your children are just beautiful. Uh, yeah, thanks, Juanita. And your wife was so kind to me at the company picnic last summer. Yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever. And she got the message, and she put the picture back on my desk and walked to the door, and then she turned and said, Mr. Matthewson, you're a good man, and I want to know you to know that I pray for you and your family every day. And then she left. Great. That's all I need. A lot of guilt piled up on everything else. But I don't have time for guilt. I've got my whole staff coming in here, and I have to have everything ready before that. And soon they start trickling in, bringing in the graphics, the spreadsheets, the cover art. I make minor changes, proofread, tweak it here and there. And by noon, It's, it's noon, it's, it's done, and it looks great. It's beautiful, and the deal's in the back, I can just taste it. And wait a minute, I'm actually hungry. So I'm gonna treat myself to lunch. So I go out to my car and start driving to the subway down the road, and then it happened. The rapture. Jesus came back. One minute, I'm driving in my Beamer, and then the next, I'm in heaven. And it always said in the Bible Jesus would come back and it made it sound like it would be sometime incessantly in the future. But all of a sudden it was very present and it happened. <clears throat> and the day was, um, uh, I don't remember the day, it really doesn't matter. But I can tell you what happened next. We went through this great throne room where a great book was open and my name was found in the book of life. And I was ushered into heaven with millions of other saints and we're walking into heaven, and I can't tell you what it was like other than to use an analogy. Have you ever seen a picture, a film of the uh, ticker tape parade in New York when everybody's jumping up and down? And it was like that, except multiply it with like millions of people and millions of emotions and the hearts and the joy and the exuberance, and it was nothing like I had ever seen before. Everyone was hugging and laughing and celebrating. 
and there's people reuniting, and I saw people that had died decades ago that I had forgotten. I missed them, and, and loved ones that I had missed dearly, and it was amazing. It was overwhelming, and, and I suddenly knew that I needed to take a, a moment by myself just to soak it all in, and so I found a place to sit and catch my breath, but I didn't feel alone. It just seemed like there was someone with me. So I looked around, and I didn't see anyone, but the feeling was so strong that I just called out, is anyone there? There he was. He was magnificent. He was about nine feet tall, and I asked, who and what are you? I'm Uriel, he replied. I'm one of the heavenly beings. I'm an angel. You're an angel? I never met an angel. Yes, Daniel. Oh, you know my name? Yes, I know all about you. I've been assigned to you since the day you were born to watch over you. You're my guardian angel? <laughs> well, Daniel, we don't use that terminology up here, but if you want to use that, that's okay. Wow. And I tried to give him a hug, and how can I describe him? It was like a hollow person made of light. I could see him, but... It, but I said, oh, Uriel, I'm so glad you're here. I have so many questions. He said, I'm here to teach you all about heaven and what's going to happen. And he taught me the ropes of heaven. And he taught me that communication is different in heaven. And we don't have to use verbal communication. And we can think about things and hear each other. So I tried it. We were talking to each other just by thinking it was incredible. And he taught me about time, how time is elastic in heaven, something that may take Five years on earth might take a minute in heaven and how something, you know, that, that might take a lot longer, might take a, a lot shorter. And we were outside of time and, and that was a new concept for me. And he taught me about eyesight. That, that something that was like 30 miles away, I might be able to see like if it was right in front of me. And, and that came in very handy in a few minutes like you'll see. And he taught me about transportation. And he could pick me up and that I didn't have to walk anymore. And he picked me up by the arms and he took me on some test pins. <laughs> See? It was so cool. And it was terrifying at first, but after I got used to it, it was so great. And then he said, you know, set me down and he said, um, I need to explain the upcoming judgment to you. I said, what? He said, the upcoming judgment. I said, well, wait, wait, wait. I, I thought I just passed that judgment. Isn't that what we just went through? Oh, he said, that was the great white throne judgment. Then I got terrified. And Uriel looked at me a bit bewildered. He said, no one ever told you about the Bema? The what? The Bema, the judgment seat of Christ. You don't remember hearing that or reading about that in your Bible? And then terror ran from the sole of my feet to the top of my head. And I went, no. It's there. It's a place where every believer will give an account of his life to Jesus. But it's not punitive. What do you mean? Well, it's a place of reward, not judgment. You remember the Olympic Games? Yes. And the winner will stand on a platform? Yes. Well, that's what the beam is like. I don't understand. Well, the Christian life is, is like a race, and you finished it. Now, Jesus is going to reward you for the things that you did and had eternal significance that had an impact on his kingdom. I was suddenly racking my brain trying to remember anything I had done of significance. And I found myself praying that Jesus' memory was a lot better than mine. And while lost in thought, I heard a great fanfare off in the distance. the judgment. Christ is calling everyone to the Bema. Come on, let's go. And you'll pick me up and we begin to fly through the heavenlies along with millions and millions of other saints flying to one place and there were throngs of Christians on the ground going towards this little circle way off in the distance and it looked little from where we were but the closer we got I realized it was getting bigger and bigger and bigger and I realized it looked something like something and I was able to zoom in and see the, the stadium, this huge big round stadium. 
But as we got closer, I was beginning to see how big it was, how massive it was. It was, it was bigger than a city. It was bigger than a metropolitan area. It was miles and miles and miles across. And then Uriel lowered me in front of the gate. And he said, go on in. I can't go in anymore. Aren't you coming with me, I asked. No, this is a special moment for the bride of Christ. Only Christian saints are allowed inside. But he said, us angels will be watching on ahead. Go in and enjoy this time with your brothers and sisters in Christ. But if you have any questions, simply direct your thoughts to me. And then off he went. And over the gate, it read, the Bema. Oh, boy. I entered in. And the place was huge beyond imagination. And then it, it looked like a great big coliseum, but larger than anything you'd ever seen. And miles away in the center was a platform. And I remember with my new eyesight, I could zoom in and see millions of people, billions of people. And, and I looked at them as, and I, I could see their faces. And it's as it's if they were right in front of me. And, and I was overwhelmed with the immensity of the Church of Jesus Christ. And I realized that the place was filling up. And I looked over, and I, I saw a place to sit. And I made my way over to the seat. Uh, excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. The anticipation was growing. The dread, the love, and the awe was growing. And I sat down next to a man. He smiled and said, my name is Indira Nagasaki. When and where are you from? I never heard that question before. I mean, I heard where are you from, but I never heard when and where are you from. And then I realized that this gathering of people was the entire history of the Christian church. All 2,000 years at once. So the question was appropriate. And I told him I was on earth. Um, he, I told him that I was on earth when Jesus had returned. And we said, what a blessed privilege that might have, must have been. And I said, where and when are you from? <laughs> and I, he said, I lived in Japan in the 17th century. Japan? He said, I didn't know that there were Christians in Japan in the 1600s. Oh, yes, he said. The great wooden trade ships that brought goods from Europe also brought missionaries. And one of them came to my small village and told us about Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man, who died a terrible death to pay the penalty for my sins. And anyone who repented and put their faith in him would get to spend eternity with him forever. And it struck a chord with me, and I believed him, as well as a lot of my family members. And even some of the samurai, the village rulers believed, but not the samurai of my village. He hated Christians, and he persecuted the church and had some of us put to death. Some of us. Were you? Yes, I was crucified along a road leading from our village along with a whole string of people who believed in Jesus. And next to me was a samurai from the next village who had been slicing people's heads off who had also believed. He had also believed. He had been a ruthless man, but Jesus transformed him. And as we hung on the crosses, he told everyone who passed by about the love of Christ. And he said he counted it an honor to die the same way Jesus did. And as he talked, I just hung my head. And he said, what's wrong, Daniel? And I said, oh, I never suffered like that. Oh, don't concern yourself, Daniel, he said. It's in God's hands who suffers. And who doesn't suffer? And if he calls you to suffer, you suffer in his grace. And if he doesn't, praise be to God for that. The feeling I had wasn't shame. It was like disappointment because he got to suffer and know Jesus better. And I thought, what a difference a day makes in perspective. I never looked at suffering in that way before. And as we walked, as we talked, I noticed the entire place had filled up. There was not one empty seat left. No one was left standing. Every spot was filled. And then from the rear, a great angel walked to the platform. He never identified himself, but he looked what I always thought would be like Gabriel or Michael. But he was about 18 feet tall. He had flowing golden robes. His face was like sculptured marble. And his deep, he had deep, compassionate eyes and a smile that I could have seen from this distance without my zoom eyes, you know. And he was carrying a staff that was probably 15 feet tall. And he wrapped it five times on the platform. Thump, thump. But by the third thump, the crowd had fallen absolutely silent. The tension 
and the anticipation in the air. Maybe three billion people gathered, but you could have heard a pin drop. And the angel spoke. Welcome to the Bride of Christ. I have come to announce the presence of your groom, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Prince of Peace, the Alpha and the Omega, the Creator and Sustainer of all things, the Light of Judah, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then Jesus entered the platform. I've never, ever seen glory like this. Remember, I could see him like he was right in front of my face. And we all just fell to our knees. And we were looking in the face of our Savior. And Jesus said, welcome. My special, my precious ones. I have long awaited this day. And when I hand out my rewards and commendation to you, what a celebration we'll all enjoy it together. Oh, my bride, please welcome my father who will preside over the judgment day. He's entering now. How could I describe what I saw? I understand now why Revelation was so hard to understand in the Bible. John trying to put into human language the things he saw in heaven. But I'll try. There was this indescribable light and shapes and colors that I had never seen before, and I somehow realized that God is spirit and that this must just be a partial manifestation of his glory entering the stadium, you know, that sometimes did in human history, in a pillar of fire or smoke or a cloud. And we fell to our knees, and the more we looked at him, and he settled his presence in the place we fell prostrate on the floor, and we couldn't even hold our head up, you know, in his presence, and the cherubim and the seraphim began to chant as they entered. They were saying over and over, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the God Almighty. And music started to come out of the presence of God. It was like we knew the words, and we all sang together. And we poured out our hearts out to the Father, and after singing of what might have been like a thousand years on earth, we went back to our seats and I thought, oh, I never sing like that on earth. We really enjoyed worshiping the Father and the Son at my church. And most of the time I just stood there with my hands in my pocket, looking at the ceiling, just mouthing a few words and then waiting for it to be over. And I guess I just never realized the presence of God in that service. But wow, if I could go back and do it again. I would sing knowing that God is there. I was looking for the day instead of the day. I didn't realize that on earth we were practicing for the day and the rest of eternity. And if I had to do it all over again, I would, I would phrase Jesus differently if I'd known so much of what I'm telling you now. And after we got through praising the Lord and wiping the tears from our faces and catching our breath, Jesus came to the center of the platform and said, it's time. The judgment is about to begin. But before we begin, let me make sure you understand what this judgment is all about. You're not on trial. Your sins have been forgiven. And as your life is reviewed, I'll not see your sins. They've been separated from you as far as east is from west. Never to be remembered, so relax. And we did. And you could just feel the tension leave the place. And he said, today, you will be rewarded for your service to my kingdom. The things you did in my power. The judgment will be based on three criteria. One, the quality of your life. In the Sermon on the Mount, I told you not to store up treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupt and thieves break in and steal. But store up treasures in heaven, because where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. Some of you have done that, and you'll receive that treasure that you sent on ahead today, and it'll be yours for all eternity. Two, you'll be evaluated on your stewardship, how well you handled what I gave you, the gifts, talents, and resources that were entrusted to you. And this will not be comparative You'll not to compare yourselves with the person sitting next to you because out of this entire gathering, no two people had exactly the same circumstances. You will be judged by what was given you and how faithfully you used it. 
Some were given tremendous resources, and you'll be evaluated on that. Some were given meager resources, and you'll be evaluated on that basis. No one was given identical opportunities, so you will be evaluated individually based on the resources granted, stewardship. And thirdly, we'll look at your motives. I told you that man looks at the outward appearance, but I look at the heart. So we'll examine the things you did and the motives with which you did them. If they were done with an earthly reward in mind, you've already received it, and it'll be consumed. And if you serve with my kingdom in mind, you will receive eternal rewards. I will decide what rewards are coming to you. And what kind of rewards might you expect in addition to the treasure you have sent ahead? Some of you will receive crowns. We will be giving out the crown of righteousness to those who live for this day, those who long for this day of my return, and pattern their life based on the fact that I was coming soon, and they lived righteous, holy, pure, and godly lives. You will be given the crown of righteousness. Then there will be the crown of glory, and it will be given to those who have shepherded my people. And I don't mean you pastors, you'll be more judged more strictly. And don't say I didn't warn you, I had my brother James to spell it out for you. And you were given so much more because you were given so much more time to spend in people's lives. No, this crowd is for you normal folk. And most of you are normal folk. And if you ministered in my power, in my grace, you will be given the crown of glory. And then there'll be the crown of life. They'll be given to those who are persecuted for my name's sake. Remember in the Sermon on the Mount, I said, Blessed are you who are persecuted for my name's sake. You will receive a reward for your persecution today. The crown of faith will be given to those who trusted in me to the end, who preserved through thick and thin in an exceptional way. And some of you receive one, some of you will receive all of them. In addition, some of you will receive a verbal commendation. I'll say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. I will say, in whom I am well pleased, my highest reward. Some of you will hear that, some of you will not. All of you will be glorified. Each one will receive your heavenly body today. The body you'll have for all eternity, and you'll be more radiant than you could ever imagine. And in just a few moments, you'll see what it looks like. It's going to be great. And it's time for the judgment to begin. And one by one, you'll be called. Please prepare your hearts for that time. And Jesus turned to take his place on the great Bema seat on the center of the platform. And we all sat there. Billions of people, and every one of us was sure we were going to go first. <laughs> the large angel came to the center of the platform and announced the first name by rapping three times with a staff, thumb, thumb, thumb. Timulus Germanicus. An angel swooped down from the gallery and retrieved Timulus from the seat, depositing him on the base of the platform and returned. Timulus slowly walked up the steps and stood before Jesus and looked at his Savior face to face for the first time. They began to talk, and an amazing thing happened. We couldn't hear what was said, but we were able to see Timulus's life. He was born in the third century in Lyon, France, under chaotic Roman rule. He was a poor man, a smith by trade, and served as a deacon at a small church. He gave what little he had to the poor and oppressed believers in the church, which was severely persecuted. Timulus, in fact, was a martyr. He was scraped which means that the skin was peeled from his body. And then he was placed on a rack and his bones were broken and dislocated. And then he was thrown to the wild animals and as they attacked him, he cried out, My name is Timulus and I belong to Jesus. Timulus fell on his face before Jesus and Jesus rose from the throne, raised him up, put his hand on his shoulders and said, This is Timulus and I'm so proud of him. And he gave us the crown of righteousness, glory, life, and faith. He got all four. And there were treasures piled all around him. And Jesus said in a loud voice, Well done, good and faithful servant. Be glorified. And Timulus shone brighter than the sun. And he flew back to his place with all his treasures with him. And he took his place. And he looked like the North Star shining in the, in the black sky. And it was a radiant thing. And we were all amazed. And we were anticipating the time that we would stand before our Savior. 
I saw more people go. Maybe millions, I don't know, because time is elastic in heaven. And I noticed some trends. I noticed that some people did not receive commendations. Well done, good and faithful servant. And I noticed that not all people heard in whom I'm well pleased. I realized that there were degrees of glorification. Some people were more brilliantly glorified than others. Kind of like when you see a diamond. It's a radiant and beautiful thing, but it's like when there's another diamond that might be cut differently, and they were, they were both radiant, but some are more radiant than others. And I, I also saw that some people came into heaven bankrupt of eternal significance. And they, they were glorified, but they were not as brilliant as the others. But as they were ushered back to their seat, I knew I, I loved them just the same. And there was no envy or jealousy or competition. There was a little sadness in my heart to think, um, you know, from the fact that I had, they had entered into their lives, you know, that sin entered into their lives after they had trusted Jesus. And as a result, they missed out on the opportunities to have an eternal impact to really make a difference. And they left them all behind. And the judgments continued. And I was amazed at the variety of people in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And the, and the angel came forward, thump, thump, thump. Pompania. Pompania lived in the first century Rome before Paul had even arrived there. She was from the senatorial class but had even become, but had become a believer about 50 AD. And she was ostracized for her faith. And even her husband ridiculed her, but she kept a consistent testimony. Eventually, she be, he became a follower of Jesus too. And they planted a church in Rome that met in their house and lasted until the third century. And she received the crown of glory for her service to the church. And she was glorified, glorified, and she was radiant, and she flew back to her place. And the angel thumped again. Thump, thump, thump. William Terry. I knew his name, but I wasn't sure why. <laughs> it turns out that there was probably no less likely hero of the church than William Carey. He was a poor shoemaker in England who didn't have two pennies to rub together. But he had a passion for the lost. He became a great world evangelist in the 17th century. He went back to Malta with no support and later went to India and he impacted England and the Western Church so much by his work that he was known as the father of modern day missions by the late church. And, and because he had planted the missions mindset at a dead church, millions of people were reached for the gospel. And Jesus did something amazing with William. He rose from his seat, turned William around to the crowd and said, I want everyone who is here today, due to the impact of William, either directly or indirectly, to stand. And the Colosseum, nearly a billion people got up. And they all clapped and said, thank you, thank you. And William fell to his feet and Jesus lifted him up and said, well done, my good and faithful servant. I'm so pleased with you. And in a moment, he was glorified. And he was changed, and he was more brilliant than he had ever was before. And he flew back to his seat, and thump, thump, thump. Angela Moser. As soon as Angela was announced, there was a fluttering of wings about the stadium. There was excitement. There was electricity. And I knew she was something special. So I directed my question to Uriel. Is she she's someone special? And he said, oh, is she something special? Why? What did she do? What did she build? What did she start? Uriel said, oh, none of those things. Nothing of earthly categories that you think are successful. She was a different type of person. I listened to her biographical sketch in her mind, in my mind, and she was a young single woman who remained single by choice. And that she could, so that she could care for her sickly mother and her invalid sister. And she was a public school teacher in the 20th century in, in Western country. And she served faithfully behind the scenes in her local church, quietly serving people. And the reason she was so famous in heaven was because of her prayer life. In fact, the news around heaven, Uriel said of Angela, was that 10,000 demons quaked in their shoes at the mere mention of her name because of the power of her prayer. And she was a great enemy of the evil one because of her prayer. And she lifted people up. And once again, Jesus said, please, if she had an impact in your salvation, stand. And I don't know how much of the stadium stood, but it was a large majority because of her prayer. And, and, and Jesus said, oh, Angela, I'm so pleased with you. Well done, good and faithful servant. 
and she was glorified in an instant. Thank you for your great faith. And her glory had gone beyond anyone who had gone before her. It was 10 times the radiance. And I thought, oh, that prayer thing, I should have listened to Dr. Stanley. That really makes a difference. <laughs> and then, thumb, thumb, thumb. Joseph Ray Robinson. Joe was born in the South during the Depression. Not an easy life for an African-American man. He was ostracized because of his race, but he never became bitter. He worked diligi diligently to support his eight children. He shined shoes, he drove limos, delivered papers, worked in office buildings. Office buildings. It was Joe, the security guard. I just recognized the guy I ran by this morning because I didn't have the time. The guy with the sunny disposition that drove me crazy. I learned that Joe, because of his race, wasn't allowed to be educated. He was not permitted to attend school, but taught himself to read by studying the New Testament. And he memorized two-thirds of the New Testament. And whenever he saw someone, he shared scripture with them. And Jesus invited everyone in the stadium who was there because of Joe's influence to stand. And then the number was immense. What an impact he made. Over 100 people from my office building alone. They were all here at the Bema seat because he had shared Christ with them. And I thought, here's this guy that this morning I had no time for. And now I doubt that I'm worthy to shine his shoes. And Jesus said, well done, good and faithful servant. Be glorified. And Joe flew back to his place radiant. Some, some, some. Juanita Perez. Yes, my cleaning lady. Juanita flew down, and Juanita saw the face of Jesus as he gazed into her eyes, and I learned that her husband had deserted her with four small children. And she poured her life into those kids, working two jobs to care for them so that they would know Jesus, and they did, and they were responsible for many more at the Bema seat. And there, as I looked at her, it hit me. It hit me. It was right there in my mind. She was another prayer warrior. And I saw how much she prayed for me and my family. And I realized that she had more impact on my kids than I had. Oh, I was humbled. And this morning, here was this woman that I wouldn't even take the time to say hello to. And it's the woman that I want to spend a thousand years right now with. All the difference a day makes. And Jesus said, well done, good and faithful servant, in whom I'm well pleased. And she was glorified and went back to her seat, a radiant being. And I looked around. I realized that about three-fourths of the stadium had been glorified. My turn must be coming, I thought again. And if I could just do it all over again. If I could, if only I would have known this when, when I was on this earth. And sure enough, after a few hundred thousand more names, thumb, thumb. Some. Daniel James Matheson. Oh boy. <laughs> Here we go. My angel Uriel flew me down to the front of the stage. And he stopped at the steps and I climbed the three steps to the platform as I and as I did, I couldn't help but think that the entire history of the Christian church was staring at my back. <laughs> but it didn't matter because looking me right in the eyes was Jesus. And I stopped at the edge, teetering at the very edge, and Jesus said, Daniel, come closer. And I was there face to face with my Savior. And he said, Daniel, come closer. Oh, yeah. So I stepped in. And we began to talk, and while I never heard, you know, the conversation between Jesus and the others before me, now I knew what it was. The conversation lasted a long time. Jesus said, Daniel, before we begin, I want to explain the judgment. I want you to know exactly what's going to, what we're going to do. And he briefly explained the judgment to me, and this is what he told me. First of all, Daniel, you need to know the purpose of this judgment here at the Bema seat. First of all, this is not to punish you for your sins. Your sins have been paid for. They've been covered with my blood. They're done. They're gone. And I thought, good. <laughs> just to make sure that they're dealt with is good enough for me <laughs> and he continued this is about stewardship this judgment is for the granting of rewards based on what you did with what I gave you you'll be rewarded for your stewardship 
how well you handled the resources that I gave you in your life, evaluating what you did in your life with what I gave you. And you'll be rewarded for what you did in your life for me and my kingdom. And you were granted 47 years of life, 36 of which after you believed in me. You were given financial resources and people resources, human resources. I gave you time, I gave you resources. You were given spiritual gifts, and we'll see how you use those gifts for eternal purposes. And we will see today how faithful you were with those. You understand. I said, okay. And he said, the next thing you need to know is about timing. Some people ask why I didn't get these rewards on earth. Why wait until now at the Bema? And the answer is, I did. I gave some rewards on earth, but you probably didn't recognize them or thought it was because you did it. But more to the point, it was not possible to fully reward you until today because it's not possible to fully evaluate your impact until today. Before today, I could not show you the full impact of your life because that impact continued until the day I called my church to myself. Sometimes it takes centuries to see that eternal impact. And when you invest in a person on earth and make an eternal impact in their life, they make a difference in their lives, and it goes on and on and on. And you'll receive partial credit for each life that was touched by you and the lives that those lives touched, like ripples in a pond that keep going out until the day I called everybody home to this place. And as I was saying this, I couldn't help thinking about the judgment of D.L. Moody that I saw minutes earlier. He was a great evangelist from a couple of hundred years ago before me, and a man of tremendous passion and the ability to communicate the gospel. And that wasn't all. Moody had started a Bible study that grew into a, a class and eventually became known as the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. And I remember my youth pastor and his wife graduated from Moody Bible Institute. And when I saw D.L. Moody's judgment, I saw his impact. And Moody got partial credit for each person that went to his school. And they got partial credit for everyone that they led to Christ. And they got partial credit for everyone that they led to Christ. And it went on and on until Jesus took the church to heaven. And I noticed this wonderful web of people that he got credit and partial credit for in each of the people who had come to Jesus through his evangelistic work. And investing in people is such a worthwhile thing. Jesus said today, Daniel, I can tell you the full impact that your life had on earth. And Jesus said, before we get started, let me tell you about the process. It's interesting. Jesus used an analogy from scripture that we used back on earth. And Jesus took me to a passage of scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 and following. And he said, the life that you lived is based on a foundation. That's me. You trusted me as your savior. Your life is like a house. When you trusted in me at age 12, I became the foundation. And it was up to you to build on that foundation. Now, just as you can build a house with cheap materials, like countertops made of glued sawdust, covered with plastic, or you can build a solid material, like marble countertops, you can build your life with worthless things or with things that matter. And I'm going to take a spiritual flamethrower, Daniel, over your life and burn all the worthless stuff away and leave only the things, the gold, the silver, that, that have eternal value. It's those things that you'll be rewarded for. And I learned about how Jesus defined worthless. I always thought worthless things were the sinful things, and they are, but they're, they were already gone. But here at the Bema, it went beyond sin. Sometimes good things were worthless because they were done out of bad motives. We're going to take a walk through your life, your entire life, and I will evaluate what you did, whether it was worthwhile eternally or worthless. And those things, my eyes will burn away. And those worthwhile things will be evaluated and you'll be rewarded for those. Are you ready, Daniel? Okay. I'm as ready as I've ever been. If I'm not ready now, when will I be? I'm ready, Jesus. And he said, you can ask questions whenever you want. Let's get started. And I heard people say, my life flashed before their eyes. Oh, well, heard that phrase? Well, my life flashed before my eyes. 
And when everyone else was up here with their judgment, it seemed to last about a minute and a half. For me, I think it lasted 47 years. Time is elastic in heaven. And I was about to live my life over again. But this time it was from his perspective, not mine. I saw my parents bring me home to their one-bedroom apartment. Oh, the joy they had. The love and compassion that they had for me. I saw my life as a toddler and a preschooler all my early years. And as Jesus watched it, he, watched, he just smiled. And as each moment passed, it was consumed by flame because there was nothing of eternal significance yet. And I looked at Jesus and there was no change. He was still smiling at me. His blood had washed them away. He had promised that he would not remember my sins anymore and he was keeping that promise. Every one of my sinful acts and worthless things were incinerated, blown away, and gone forever. And that I'm not going to even remember them again. What a joyful moment. And I was going to really be free from the guilt of all my sins for eternity when this was all over. But the most joyful moment and the highlight of my early years came at the age of 12. When my Sunday school teacher, Mrs. McCabe, told me about Jesus and I stayed after class and prayed to ask Jesus to forgive me of my sins and be my savior. And from this vantage point, I saw my heart go from stained with sin to purity. And I saw my soul go from death to life and I could actually see the presence of the Holy Spirit fill me. And I looked to Jesus and he was looking at me and tears were in his eyes and they were starting to roll down his cheeks and he said, oh, Daniel, I love you so much. Thank you for believing in me alone for your salvation. And I said, no, no, no. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. No, thank you. Thank you. And we were all thanking each other and we were so much in love. It was such a precious moment. And Jesus said, okay, Daniel. Now we can really get down to business because from this point on you're saved and now you have the ability with my spirit to do things of eternal significance. So let's see what happened. And we went from that time on through the rest of my life. And you don't have all those times for you this afternoon, so I'm going to have to summarize it for you by sharing with you three lessons that I learned about my life from Jesus' perspective. The first thing I learned was what... Jesus thinks is more important than what anyone else thinks of me combined. And I noticed a pattern in my life when I was very young. And the pattern was that I, I had a strong desire to be accepted by people. As a result, I would do whatever I could to have them accept me. Their opinion was more important than Jesus' opinion. And it started in my elementary years. Jesus reminded me of a little boy, Jimmy. My best friend, one day we were playing on the jungle gym and we were climbing around and having fun and some of the other boys came over. They were part of the in-group. You know, and they said, hey Daniel, you want to come play baseball with us? And I said, oh sure, we'd love to play with you guys. But they said, no, no, we only have one more spot and we just want you, we don't want Jimmy. So I looked at Jimmy and said, well, and Jimmy said, it's okay, go, go ahead, go ahead. So I left him wanting to play baseball with my new in-crowd friends and never looked back at Jimmy, but from the Bama seat, I could see that I broke Jimmy's heart. Their opinion was more important than what Jesus thought. And I hurt my best friend. And I never really played with him again. And I realized that when I was on earth, I never asked what Jesus thought about my situations. It was just that, what would others think of me? And it, Continued on as I went into my teen years, I dressed and wore my hair long like the others, drove my dad crazy, we argued and fought about it, I, I saw how I hurt my parents and it wasn't about the hair or the clothes, it was about my image. All I cared about was what others thought about me. And out of frustration I asked Jesus, why was I so, so concerned about it? everybody else's opinion about me? What's wrong with me? And he said, Daniel, I'm the bread of life. If you had feasted on me, you would have been satisfied. But because you neglected me and my work, you had inner emptiness. And you, you tried to fill it with the world, and as a result, you made poor decisions about your life. And that poor decision-making continued into college. I left for the university with my best friend, Jerry. We were best buddies. We were going to be roommates for the entire college experience, all five or six years. <laughs> Nothing was ever going to split us up. But then we were just getting settled into our apartment and some guys I had met invited me to be a part of their fraternity. And I said, sure, we'd love to be a part of your friend, but they said, no, no, we only want you. 
And I looked at Jerry, and Jerry said, oh, never mind about me. And I said, are you sure? And he said, sure, you go ahead. And I have been in Jerry, and I never looked back. But here, from the Bama seat, I could see what it did to him. And it grieved me, and I, I couldn't afford the, you know, he couldn't afford the apartment. He had no close friends, and eventually left school and went home. And I could see how my decisions and selfishness had hurt him and affected his entire life. And I thought to myself, oh, if I could just do it again. If I could do it all again, I would think about what Jesus thought of me and not what others have thought of, think about me. That was one observation. Here's a second lesson. Worthwhile is better than worthless. The second lesson I learned was investing in people is the only worthwhile investment. One of the things that became apparent in my judgment process was the people were very important to Jesus. I used to see people as kind of like scenery in my life. They only existed to make me look good. They were instruments in my life so that I could get my goals done. But Jesus doesn't see people that way. Jesus is passionate about people. He saw them as unique individual people created in his image that he died for. He loved them and he valued them. And they were worth dying for and being a servant for. And I learned that when you pour your life into another person, it makes a difference in heaven at the Bema. And it makes sense since human beings are eternal the things we do for other humans have eternal implications. I missed the boat. But I saw that in one particular episode from my life, it was while I was in high school, I got involved in our church youth group, and the leader was a really cool guy named John. And he took me under his wings and he encouraged me to study my Bible, and it was a, a time of real growth for me. And I actually led a, a small group of kids from the church, and one day a young girl came, and her name was Sandy. She was so shy, and I introduced her to John and to the other kids, and she was placed in my group, and I said to Jesus, hey, I forgot all about Sandy. Whatever happened to her? Jesus showed me how that she had trusted Christ with me in prayer three weeks after I introduced her to the group, and how she had grown in the study that I'd led, and she'd gone off to college and was involved in campus ministry and shared Jesus' love with students there, and I got partial credit for each of them. And some of them impacted others. And I got partial credit for those who were saved. And she got married to a great Christian man. And then she had three wonderful kids who became strong Christians and who were active in their church and, and their uh, school and impacted other kids. And I got partial credit for that too. And she went on to be a disciple of women. I got partial credit for that. And she taught the Bible. I got partial credit for that. And I was so overwhelmed to, it, by the impact I could have as a senior high school kid. And Jesus said, oh, Daniel, you invested in that girl, and look at the dividend that paid. And Jesus said, hold out your hand. And I did. And he placed a big jewel in them. And it was a beautiful and bright, and I was amazed. And Jesus looked at it, and flames came and burned away all the impure motives that were part of it. And when he was done, it was even brighter than before. And he said, way to go, Daniel. Thank you for pouring your life into Sandy and for making a difference in my kingdom. It's worth investing in people. And I started thinking about the wood, the hay, and the stubble, and the passage in 1 Corinthians, the cheap things and how we build our lives with. And I used to think that it was meant, you know, just meant for evil things. But I learned differently. What it means is that things might have no eternal significance, the things that are burnt up. And I said, but Jesus, when did I do anything with pure motives? And he said, never. You're human. You're incapable of that. You're incapable of doing anything with 100% pure motives. But Daniel, I look for the dominant motive. And when I apply my fire to that event, the impure motives will be burned away, and your work will be purified by the fire, not destroyed by it. And he said, sometimes you put money in the plate at church so that the guy next to you will be impressed by what you did. Gone. Worthless. But the other times you gave because you saw a need. And you were honestly gave without your right hand knowing what your left hand was doing. You did it in secret. You did it quietly. And because you wanted to help. And those things are jewels in your building. And even though there were things that looked good on the outside, the motives were completely impure, and as a result, they're worthless. But those 90% pure motives, what the fire doesn't purify, 
those things become 100% pure, so you'll be rewarded for those things for all eternity. And I said, I'm starting to get it. I didn't have too many of those worthwhile times, did I, Jesus? He said, no, the worthless times far outnumbered the worthwhile ones. And then he reminded me of Peggy. And after joining the fraternity, I jumped right into that lifestyle, never asking what Jesus thought. And I started drinking a lot. I dated all the frat girls and bedded as many women as I could. That was pretty empty. And I just wanted to impress the guy, so I drank and did drugs. Then I met Peggy. She was different. She seemed so radiant, so pure, so innocent. She wasn't active sexually. She wasn't drinking, but it didn't take me long to lead her down the wrong path. It seemed that the more impact I had on her, the more desperate she became. And we began to fight. She was angry with me, and eventually we broke up, complete strangers. And I thought I was going to die right there, standing in front of Jesus. And I said, Jesus, I'm, I'm so responsible. It, it's my fault that she struggled so. I said, Jesus, what ever happened to Peggy? He said she was married three times. The first two husbands were abusive. The third abandoned her. She turned to alcohol and drugs to ease the pain. I hung my head. It's all my fault. No, Daniel, it's not your fault. People are responsible for their own choices. You're responsible to Peggy. You're not responsible for Peggy. So you influenced her away from me when you could have brought her closer to me, but she made her own choices in the matter. She's responsible for her actions and decisions. Well, I asked, whatever happened to her? And Jesus said shortly after her third divorce, a person at a shelter shared my love with her, and she believed. And she's here right now at the Bayman, and she wants to talk to you. She does. <laughs> Relax, Daniel. It'll be okay. Grace abounds in heaven. She wants to thank you for the good things you poured into her life. And I thought, oh, if I could only do it again, what I would do first. First, I'd worry about Jesus' opinions and not other people's opinions. And then I would focus my life on, focus my life on things of eternal significance, worthwhile things instead of worthless things that I spent so much time on. Well, the third lesson I learned was that everything looks different at the Bema. Perspective is everything. And the perspective at the Bema, see, is a completely different view on what, from what I enjoy. Let me give an example. Shortly before Jesus returned, I made a switch in my working relationship. There was Ben Hogan. Ben Hogan was this premier guy in the industry, in the city. He was top dog, top dog. And one day he called me up, and my heart was pounding. And he said, Daniel, I want to talk to you about a job. Come over. And he started schmoozing me. He started flattering me. He talked to me how great I was and how valuable I was. And he told me that he'd double my salary. Double my salary. And I started imagining what I'd like to buy and, and be able to do. And, and, then, and then I said, I need, to, I need to talk to my boss. He said, don't wait too long. The offer won't be on the table for very long. So I went to talk to John Mitchell. John Mitchell was a godly, honest man of integrity. He was one of my father's friends. And he had given me a job after college. He got me started. I did very well in his company. And I told him I thought about going into business with Ben Hogan. He wasn't really excited about that. He really didn't try to talk me out of it. But he said, Daniel, think very carefully. And I thought, double my salary. And a chance to get in with the in crowd, that whole thing again, in the in crowd. And I, I thought, I'll make a handshake agreement with you that I won't take any of the people that I bought to our company, that I brought over our company to Van Hogan's for at least three years, okay? He said, okay. And we shook hands on our no compete agreement. And I left and went to work for Hogan. And his demeanor changed quickly. And he started drilling me and telling me to quota, and he started me work, started making me work long hours that were ridiculous, and I, I was doing well. I, I, um, I met the quotas, I went up two house sizes in a year and a half, and the next two months I, I, I bought a boat and some really cool stuff. And I wasn't seeing the family much, it was just for a short time, and then I would be able to have anything that I wanted, 
And I was in with the in crowd. I was going to all these sport events. I was sitting in box seats. Really great stuff. I was really, really excited. I mean, that's how I thought down there. Up here from the Bama seat, I look like a Venus flag, you know, a flag flying around a Venus flag fab. And I saw Hogan as the slimy businessman that he was. I saw him as the cruel, money-motivated man that he was, who didn't care about people. Perspective is completely different up here. And then one day Hogan said, I want you to get the Metro Capital account. I said, but that's a Mitchell account. I promised I wouldn't take anything from his business for three years. He said, do you have a, uh, a no-compete contract with John Mitchell? I said, no. I didn't sign anything. We just shook hands. I gave him my word. He said, get it. I said, I can't. He said, get it or be gone. Okay, okay. So I went and I grappled the Metro account, the capital account away. It wasn't hard. I know all the relationships and it tore the heart of my friend John Mitchell and I wrote my word to him. I lost contact with him, but from the Bama, I saw how it devastated his business. He was a good man. My own selfish motives. And my life sped by from that time. I was focused in what I could accomplish monetarily, and I was so focused on earthly things, I completely neglected my Heavenly Father. And the rest of my life, to be honest, was incinerated right before my eyes. Jesus said, Daniel, your judgment is complete. Come here to the front of the platform, and we'll summarize it, and you'll be glorified. And here's what he said. Jesus said, Daniel, he said, yes, Jesus. He said, you were given financial resources beyond the dreams of most people. In fact, you were among the top 1% of wealth in all of human history. But you never were content with your financial blessing. You squandered most of that on yourself. You gave very little to my kingdom or my work. And as a result, there's very little stored up for you here. There is very little to celebrate it about your financial stewardship. And you were given tremendous human resources. You had godly parents that poured into your life. You had lay people that poured into your life. You had pastors that taught you the word. But you neglected all that so that you could be successful in the world eyes. <clears throat> and there were certainly moments of positive impact for the kingdom, but the worthlessness of your life far outweighed the worthwhileness. I thought, oh, what could I possibly hear? It could be worse than that. There could be never worse words spoken than to hear Jesus tell you your life is worthless. Then he said something worse. He said, Daniel, the summary of your judgment is this. You left your first love. Oh. Oh. I fell to my knees, thinking I'd never be able to rise again. You left your first love. That sound just echoed in my mind. It was true. I knew it was true. I had. I asked him to save me and completely neglected him. I didn't allow him to work through me at all. It was a completely true statement. There was no pretense in it at all. No fake in it. There was no yeah buts. It was true. I left my first love. <laughs> then, I heard the most gracious, glorious words. As I looked into his face, it was yet unchanged. He still looked at me with passion and love and grace in his eyes. But he said, Daniel, always remember, your first love never left you. Oh. oh, thank you, Jesus. And then he said, Daniel, always remember, there's now no condemnation for those who are in me. Oh, he's not going to condemn you. Oh, thank you, Jesus. 
And then remember, the old is gone, the new is here. The old has passed away, but the new is here. Oh, Daniel, it's all uphill from here. And I realized that there were tears pouring from my eyes. And I was confused because I'd always been told that there would be no tears in heaven. But I remember that verse in Revelation that said he would wipe away all the tears, supposing that there would be tears. And, and there were tears of regret and shame and disappointment. Oh, if only I could have lived my life differently. Then Jesus did it to me. He got up off of his throne. He walked to me. He wiped away my tears. And I never ever, for all eternity. My crying days were over. And then he grabbed my hands and he picked me up and I felt a lightning bolt go through my body and I was glorified in a moment. <laughs> and, and you know what happened? All that stuff that had been incinerated in my life, it was completely and absolutely obliterated from my memory. I couldn't remember a thing. All that was left were the things of eternal significance and the rewards that he'd given me. And as he stood behind me, Jesus placed his hand on my shoulders, and I stood there with my one jewel. And it was beautiful. And Jesus said, this is my beloved, Daniel James Matthewson. Welcome him. And the whole crowd went nuts, and they started cheering and clapping, and I flew back to my seat in my own power now, in my own glorified body, and I looked down and I could see my wife and kids and they were jumping up and down and they were celebrating for me and they were cheering me and going like this, you know. And when I got back to my seat, all the people were patting me on the back and hugging me and saying that they were so proud of me and I was so overwhelmed with joy. And all that was left was the pure stuff. <coughs> and I thought, oh, this is what heaven is all about. I get it now. Oh, yay, Jesus, thank you, God. Someone in the front of the platform went running up the stairs. They took off the crown they had received as a reward, the crown of faith, and they ran up to the throne, and they threw it down. And with a huge grin on their face, I could tell this, this was the most ultimate act of worship. And I saw someone else take their crowns, and they threw it down at the throne. And I saw someone else threw theirs down. And then someone else threw theirs down. And they lay prostrate before Christ. And they worshipped him. And they praised him. And they threw their crowns down and worshipped his name. And I was standing up on my feet just wishing I had a crowd to throw down. Oh to worship Jesus in that way. And as they threw down their crowns from all over the stadium, the music was played. And they started to sing. They sang this beautiful song. And as the worship continued, we were drawn to the face of our Savior. We were drawn to the tears in His eyes, the love and the grace that He had for us, the compassion and the passion that He had for us. And we were amazed. And we were amazed that he would save us. That he would love us. That he would do unto us what he said he would do. And that this was all taking place. And we were just amazed. And we started to see. And after pouring out our hearts to the Lord a long, long time, we sat down to catch our breath. And Jesus strode to the end of the platform, crying over the crowds that had been laid at his feet. And he said, the judgments are now complete. I'm sure that you have a lot of catching up to do. Go. <laughs> and you got to understand this stadium was made up of a billion plus souls. And every one of them is radiant as the sun rising in the morning. And every star and they took off at once, and it was the most amazing fireworks display you've ever seen. And I took off to a place that I knew intrinsically that my family would be. And there was my wife and my kids, and they were 
we hugged, we embraced, and my parents who had gone before us and their parents, and there was this huge family reunion, and it was a blessed moment. And I ran into John Mitchell, the man who I'd broken my word to, and he ran toward me like the father of the prodigal son, and he threw his arms around me and he said, oh, Daniel, I love you. And I saw Sandy, and she was more radiant by far than me, and she said, oh, Daniel, thank you so much for impacting me. And I said, oh, no, no, thank you for being impacted by me. You were one of the only ones I really appreciated. <laughs> and then I turned and there was Peggy. There was no shame. There was no anger in her eyes. Only grace and love and purity and honor. Unconditional love. And we embraced and we talked about the good things of life. And as we were walking, I heard a sound. Could it have been a, another trumpet sound? No, it was different. It was a sound that I hadn't heard yet in heaven. It was an irritating sound. What was it? Oh no. Oh no, oh no. No! I turned off my alarm clock and I opened my eyes and I said, oh no! It was a dream! There was my life, my wife lying in bed. It was a dream. I want to go back. Which woke up, my wife was sleeping next to me. She grumbled something and rolled over. And I sat at my bed, the side of my bed, and then I remembered all those times I sat at the Bama seat. If I could go back and do it over, if only I had another chance. And Jesus said to my spirit, Daniel, you have another chance. This is the first day of the rest of your life. What are you going to do with it? And I looked at my wife and I thought, honey, this is going to be different from you from now on. And I walked down the hall and I poked my head in my kids' rooms and I said, daddy's home and he's coming big time. Life is going to be different from now on. And I went to my living room and I sat on the couch and took out my Bible and I read 2 Corinthians 5 and 1 Corinthians 3 and Romans 14 and some of the parables that Jesus talked about, rewards, and I realized that everything that I dreamed was biblically sound. And I looked up and said, oh Jesus, things are going to be different now. I want them to be different. And I got down on my knees to pray and I prayed a prayer of commitment. I com communicated my desire to be walking intimately with him, to be used by his spirit for his purpose for the rest of my life. And I made myself available for whatever what he wanted me to do. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna make that opportunity available to you. If during this presentation, the Holy Spirit touched your heart and you're sensing in your heart you want to be different right now. Whatever that means, I'm going to invite you on your knees if you want, if you're physically capable, or leaning over on a chair. If you're not physically able, that's fine. But if that's your heart's desire, I invite you to join me right now on your knees. I'm going to pray a little first and then you can join me in the quietness of your heart. Lord, thank you for this group of people, guests and friends of First Baptist Atlanta. They're so special to you. You've laid it on my heart if we can just get it. There's so many resources that we have represented in this room that you've given us. If we can just get it. The impact that we could have, it's, it's so beyond us. We can't even begin to imagine. Lord, that's our heart. That's our desire. We know that individually we need to get there so that corporately we can have that kind of an impact. So we who are praying now, we pray this earnestly. We pray this because we mean it. And Lord Jesus, here's our prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for saving me. 
Thank you for changing me. Lord Jesus, I desire to live for you fully. I want my motive today to please you. And I can't do this on my own. Only by your spirit is this possible. Lord Jesus, I ask you these things. Bring this picture back to my mind when I need it. Help me to remember it. Help me to live for the day. Give me the desire to live for the day. Give me the ability to live for the day. And help me to impact people, Jesus. Help me to invest my life in worthwhile things. I'm trusting you to do this in me because I can't do it myself. And I look forward to seeing you face to face. Oh, what a day that will be. I love you, Jesus. And I pray these things in your name. Amen.